This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic 9, Segmenting and Targeting Markets. Well, uh, to get started on this thing, let's kind of look over some of the concepts we're dealing with uh, in this whole business of segmenting and targeting markets. And we start with a market. Uh, and, and basically, on a market, I'm just saying I got people and organizations who want and need your product and service, and another key then, they're able and willing to buy. That is, they're qualified. So if I get a 12-year-old kid who has no money, he got no money, his mom and dad have no money, uh, they're not qualified, they're not part of the market. Then what I do when I've got this great big market, I break it into market segments. That is, subgroups that have similar needs, which is enabling the marketing manager to uh, kind of tailor a marketing mix to meet their specific needs. And having done that, I then choose one or more of these that I'm going to address. Now, your big question on this, how many segments are there, and of those, uh, how many are you going to go out to address? Let's take a real simple look at a, at, at a situation on a, on a market segmentation. I might be, in this case here, I'm just segmenting on the bases of age and gender. And, uh, and I might be looking at no segmentation. I might do it by sex. I might do it by age. Uh, I might do it by each person, individual segment. And of course, in market segmentation, if I take this thing to the extreme, every single individual is a market segment. That in, in a consumer product, that's probably not practical. Uh, but it might be for certain kinds of unique products and services. Um, a lawyer, an architect, each one of their customers is, in effect, may well be a market segment. So to sum what we're doing here in market segmentation, I'm trying to divide a large um, heterogeneous market into a number of smaller homogeneous sub-markets. Now, seldom, probably never, is there one great big a homogeneous market to be addressed with one product for everybody because anything can be addressed somehow. Um, used to be said in the old days, chicken was chicken. Yeah, until Frank Perdue came out and had the Perdue chicken. And it's, well, it's, it's, I don't know what they feed them. I think they feed them corn or something. They're a little yellower. They're a little more tender. Yeah, be, be differentiated. They made chicken is a little bit special here. Um, <clears throat> we've kind of noted a little bit of this. Coke versus Pepsi. It's the image. It's all brown pop in the bottle. But Pepsi has come across with the idea of <clears throat> their image, their perception, their positioning is a little bit different. Uh, I remember my days at Coke. This is, this is embarrassing. I have to admit this. But they actually had a commercial, a 30-second commercial they put out. The theme of the commercial was Coca-Cola has 5% less calories than Pepsi. No one cares. <clears throat> That's not how you would differentiate Coke from Pepsi. You differentiate it by who you are, the reference group, and so forth like that. Here's one that's come up recently. I think this is really good. Um, retirement programs. <clears throat> what do you see in retirement programs? Everybody does a retirement program. Some old people walking down the beach and holding hands in their retirement and all this. It kind of says you're old, you're through working, and you're going into retirement. Ameriprise, they can a different pitch to it. They come up with their dream book. <clears throat> retirement is not a time to just sit back and sort of take it easy and do nothing. Now's the time to go out and pursue all your dreams, all the things you always wanted to do. Now you can go out and do them. <clears throat> it's a whole different positioning on what retirement's all about. So Ameriprise has this dream book. It's, t it's intangibilizing and intangible. Now here's the whole point to all this. Certain subgroups are going to respond more favorably to certain kinds of differentiation. And frankly, it is a whole lot easier to market to and satisfy smaller homogeneous segments than it is larger segments of dissimilar customers. So let's get on, on to where we're coming on to now and look at some of the qualifying criteria that we would look at in determining whether we're going to have a market segment. <clears throat> well, first of all, it's got to be substantial. That is, it's large enough that it's going to be profitable for us. It's got to be identifiable and measurable. That is, who is it? How many are there? Uh, that was, remember, we were talking about the um, social service agencies trying to put together uh, programs and messages on drug and alcohol programs. That's the issue. I, I don't, who are they? How many are there? Um, accessibility. Uh, can I reach them? This was the question we had earlier before we talked about um, <clears throat> target markets like the homeless, uh, undocumented aliens, and so forth like that. I'm not sure. How can I get to these people? Then responsiveness. We're saying that each segment has got to respond differently to a marketing mix, or there's no need to segment them. By this, here's what I mean. Let's say you had a 
a market segment that's defined in a number of characteristics, and then it had age group, women um, 20 to 29, and in other words, all the same except in women uh, 30 to 39. If those two segments respond exactly the same way, there's, there's no need to have separate segments. Combine them into one, women 20 to 39. So the questions we got here, on what bases can I break down the market into subgroups that have similar needs, then which groups am I going to target, and how do I develop a marketing mix to address that opportunity? Now, this is not a one-time thing. You've got to go out and revisit this on a regular basis. The world, people, needs, competitive alternatives are constantly changing, particularly in volatile industries. Yeah, I guess the package detergent market isn't changing radically. Uh, fashion clothing sure is. So on a lot of these more volatile markets, you've got to go back and, and relook at this whole thing uh, on a regular ongoing basis. So let's take a look at what are some of the segmenting bases that we would start off with. And first of all, let's talk about some of the traditional bases, geography. Uh, electronic, electric blankets are going to sell pretty well in Boston, not too well in Miami. Uh, solar hot water heaters will do pretty well in Phoenix, not too well in Syracuse. Uh, Syracuse is designated the, the least percentage of possible sunshine of any city in the country. Keep that in mind, considering moving there. Uh, demographics, okay, for some products. Demographics such as age, gender, family status are important, but as we have noted here, demographics should not be the only segmenting variable, but it might be one. Benefits sought, usage rate. Chances are that your benefits sought and your usage rate are going to be the function of some other base that you're going to be looking at. So we don't have to look at those just by themselves. Um, if I'm looking at, for instance, I want heavy users, I want um, I want the heavy users in the beer market. Well, that's going to be young males. It's like um, guys under 29 consume like 90% of the beer. Um, if I'm looking at um, just the profile of people that smoke cigarettes, that's going to tend to be uneducated, lower, lower and middle working class kind of people. But by far, the most important segment base, basis is psychographics. So let's look at some of the psychographic bases because these are the ones we're really going to be spending our time with. An example of psychographics. Um, I might have some nonprofit organization that is appealing to bleeding heart tree huggers uh, that want to save the rainforest. That might be one. Uh, I might have as another one, uh, Martha Stewart Living is appealing to Gulf Breeze housewives that want to improve their personal space. Now, the key to psychographics is we were talking about lifestyle. That's what I want to get to. Because people with similar psychographics, personality and motives, are going to tend to have similar component lifestyles and will have similar demographic benefit and usage patterns and will positively respond to similar intangible cues and positioning themes and will tend to live in the same neighborhoods, which is the basis of geodemographics. The thing that's interesting about geodemographics is it can actually be a segmenting base for you uh, because different neighborhoods, perhaps defined by zip code, have got similar psychographics and similar component lifestyles. Remember, I've been talking here a bit about the demographic trap, what can happen to you if you start segmenting strictly on demographics. Well, here's an example of how this comes out. Um, a traditional family, mom, dad, and a couple of kids living in a gentrified in-town neighborhood are much more similar um, to their very diverse neighborhoods than they are to their counterparts, mom, dad, and a couple of kids living out in the suburbs. Which means, by the way, I might very well, in a number of opportunities, be able to define my market segments by zip code. And here's another thing, too looking at segmenting by geodemographics, I can, I can find it viable for very, very small businesses to be able to go into traditional media advertising. Uh, you know how it is about 28 and 58 past the hour. They go to, um, to local commercial on the cable. So Sandy Sansing is not advertising in Dallas. Sandy Sansing is only advertising in Pensacola, probably south side of Pensacola. Okay, when you break to local cable, and you're going to the local market. There's any number of, uh, of, of segments you can go to. You could probably have, during that 30-second spot, 
the cable company might be running a hundred different spots to different neighborhoods. You could have a very small business, say a Jewish deli in Chicago someplace, and they're basically saying our business is basically three blocks by three blocks around this building. Nine square blocks is all the business we do. We can go that. We can, we can run that. When we split cable, we can be going just to the homes in that three by three block area. Now, the cost per contact is high, but it's totally targeted. And so it's viable for them to run a 30 second spot on break. And here's the thing, you don't have to go big luxurious equipment to come up with a pretty good quality local commercial. Uh, you, got a, you got basically a, a camera with a tripod, you got a, a, a studio with some graphics and maybe some stock footage that you can run, uh, some people running along the beach, some traffic down, stuff like this. Take a few shots inside the place with customers, take a picture of the outside. You can put together a real decent kind of commercial in a matter of a couple of hours. So all this business about the geodemographics and split cable has a lot of implications. So okay, so, so to where we are here, let's take a review and what we've done to this point. Basically what we're saying is we're going to select a market, we'll choose the bases and the descriptions for them, we're going to profile them, describe them, then we're going to choose which markets we're going to go after, and then at that point we will develop a marketing mix. And when we do that, we've got four different strategic options. Let's take a quick look at what they are. Uh, you've got undifferentiated, in which it's everything for just uh, one market for everybody. Concentrated, only one market, but not quite as big. The niche market, one market and fairly small. And then multi-segment marketing, in which we're, uh, we're basically looking at a number of different marketing mixes to different different places. So let's, let's look at these puppies one at a time. First of all, undifferentiated market segment. I'm saying I got one product, I got one marketing mix for everybody, all my customers. Uh, classic example of this, the Model T Ford, here's the car. You can have it in one color as long as it's black. The old Coca-Cola six and a half ounce returnable bottle until 1958, that was it. That was the only product the company made at that point. When you're doing the undifferentiated, it's kind of a shotgun approach. You basically say that you think there's little difference among segments, same product's gonna go for everybody, which by the way, probably means you're a lousy marketer when it comes right down to it, and it leaves you vulnerable to a competitor who does differentiate. As Henry Ford discovered, when General Motors came along with different cars for different segments and different colors, Coca-Cola discovered when Pepsi came along with a bigger product, uh, in a 12 ounce, do you want me to sing twice as much for nickel too, Pepsi, Cola, is a drink for you? I won't do it. But, and diet drinks and the lemon lime drinks and all the rest of this stuff here. So you're vulnerable if you take this attitude that we can just throw the same thing out to everybody. You probably don't want to don't want to go there. Next possibility you got is concentrated marketing mix. Uh, now here's what I'm going. I'm just going after one segment, but I'm going to go after the segment that I feel is going to be most receptive to whatever my differential advantage might be in my positioning in the mind, my ability to deliver it, the product, and what have you. Or, to take that to the next step, probably your best opportunity, niche marketing. Niche marketing, a.k.a. guerrilla marketing. <clears throat> Here's what you do. You're going after a segment that is small enough to defend, and the big guys ain't going to mess with it. <clears throat> so you want to open up a clothing store for men. You know, like, open up a clothing store for men. O open up a big and tall shop that's going for guys who are at least six foot six or 300 pounds, instead of trying to go head to head against everybody. What you want to do when you're thinking marketing, and by the way, this is for all of y'all who are probably going to go to work in a small business or start your own small business, niche, niche, two or three percent market segment, and you're going to go for that little segment that you can uniquely serve. Avoid the majority fallacy in this case, and that is you're going after the biggest part of the market just like everybody else. <clears throat> just amazing. I get these marketing textbooks on a regular basis, and I get one sent to me, and it had the soap market, and um, one of these two-by-two two matrices, you see a few more here at the end of the program here, and we, do, we love these in marketing because it kind of lets us position ideas on a two-by-two two matrix, but it was a soap market, and um, oh, I don't know, I think it was gentle versus harsh, and fragrant versus basic, or I don't know, whatever it was, anyhow, all the soaps, the bar soaps, are up here in the upper left-hand corner, except for one, lava. It's down here in the bottom right-hand corner. And the textbook is saying, well, lava is clearly out of touch being down here. They need to move up into the segment just like everybody else. 
To which I'm saying, are you crazy? Lava's got this all of themselves. We've hit this, this idea on and on here. When nobody else is there, it's yours. We'll see more of that later, too. But lava is the, is the one when the guys are working in your car all day and they're getting all greasy. What do you think, that, what do you think they're doing? They're washing themselves up with a dub beauty bar? They're cleaning up with lava. It's the product. It's got it. They never have to promote it. It is exactly where you want to be. In the niche market, you're going to look where everybody else is, and you're going to do just exactly the opposite thing. The last one you got then is multi-segment marketing. Uh, with this one, more than one target market, separate marketing mix for each one of them. Now, as we're going to note in a moment here, um, I may have a different marketing mix, but the same product. That's pretty neat. When I want to go into multi-segment marketing and I don't have to come up with a whole new product for all of these segments. But traditionally, we got Stouffer's, they got their gourmet entrees vis-a-vis -vis the lean cuisine. Um, pharmaceutical companies are marketing different cold medications aimed at different kind of symptoms you might have. Now, here's the thing when you go into multi-segment marketing. Um, beware of a potential major problem when you go into uh, this kind of strategy, and that is cannibalization and the new product sales are coming out of existing lines. So P&G goes in with liquid Tide. p and is going in and they're saying, we want to get into the liquid detergent market. <clears throat> so they come out with liquid Tide and say, we're going to compete with this product in the liquid detergent segment. Yeah, but where do you think the sales are coming from? Yeah, granular Tide. That granular Tide users that used to buy it in the box are now buying liquid Tide. They're cannibalizing. They're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, you may remember uh, when I started the intro to the class here and, and kind of talked about some of the things that I had done working at Coca-Cola and all, and the products I had worked on in Mellow Yellow, and uh, then right after I left the company, Diet Coke came on the scene. Diet Coke at the time. Uh, was absolutely the biggest new product intro in the history of the soft drink industry. It surpassed what Mellow Yellow had done uh, a few years before. But here is the, the other side of the story. Diet Coke was the biggest, biggest new product ever. But it was a net loss. They lost more sales out of brand Coke and Tab than they gained in Diet Coke. All cannibalization. Think about that. You got a vending machine, you got a button on the vendor. Well, you're going you're to put your money in, you're going to buy one product, that was all. But here's what happened, and it comes down to this theme we have talked about on and on. Execution implementation. They went into the outlets. They say had six facings for Coke and a couple facings for Tab. Well, they take out a couple facings for Coke and one a facing for Tab to give three facings for Diet Coke. They were just taking their own space. When you take your own space, you lose visibility, you lose sales. You go into an account, Coke's in there. We just take out a couple, a couple of Cokes and put in, put in some Diet Cokes in there. You just can't, you're just demanding cannibalization. That's not the way Pepsi always did it. Pepsi's coming out with something new. They're coming out with a Diet Mountain Dew or something like that. They don't take space from Mountain Dew. They don't take space from Pepsi. They use it as a vehicle to get incremental space in the account. They'll go into the stores and say, hey, guys, you're selling this Fago and some of this other stuff here. It ain't turning it at all. We can take a couple of facings away from your Fago and put it in, uh, put it in a Diet Mountain Dew. Point being here, to try to avoid this cannibalization, make sure at account level that you get incremental shelf space and maybe even new outlets as well. Expand your channels and all that. Uh, can't do it in a vending machine, but you can certainly do it in, uh, in a regular retail outlet. Well, in all of this, we have the issue then of positioning. And this is a real key that we're going to get into in, in any kind of market segmentation. Uh, positioning is something that Al Rees and Jack Trout wrote, literally wrote the book Positioning. And what we're saying on positioning is, where does your product or your company fit in the mind of the customer? And similarly, how are you differentiated vis-a-vis -vis competition? Now, on the positioning, we get into, so how in the mind, let's say, when I say overnight delivery of packages, you say FedEx, because FedEx holds the position in the customer's mind for overnight delivery of packages. Now, here's the fact. The United States Postal Service has comparable services at cheaper prices than FedEx, but FedEx dominates the market 
because it has the position in the customer's mind. And when you've got the position in the customer's mind, that means you can get a higher price. Your competition has to beat you by trying to hit you on price. Um, now, here's the thing you can do on, position, uh, on positioning. You can position at any number of the segment bases that we described. Or you can position directly against the competition. A leave. One a leave is six Tylenol, positioning against the competitor. Uh, Audi basically positions themselves vis-a-vis -vis BMW. But also, primarily, what you're going to do with this is you're going to position on those bases of psychographics and lifestyle. So I was noting, if you don't have to have a different product, um, uh, basically, Harley Davidson has got seven market segments, same product, the same bike, but they have different lifestyle and psychographics. So you got the hog rider on one end of the scale here, who's driving the thing up to Sturgis every summer to get into the bike fest, and then you've, got, then you've got the boy down here that's playing the, the stock market in Manhattan and making half a million dollars a year and wants a toy. They're totally different people. They look at totally different media. They're totally different lifestyle, but it's the same product. So Harley Davidson is doing that. Pepsi, as we said, Pepsi positions itself because we're young and cool. Um, Mountain Dew, positioned to extreme sportster boys or those to whom it's aspire. Uh, we look at... Um, here locally, I kind of wonder, Chan's, is Chan's a, a college bar or a redneck bar? Chan's used to be the college bar back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. It was back behind University Mall. Now it's up there on Nine Mile Road. Well, they've been having, I, I've seen a couple of times, they do college night on Wednesday nights or something like that. No, they're not positioned that way. They don't have that in the mind of the customer. So we're looking then at, at all of this. Oh, I, I promised you, here's some more of those uh, two by two matrices that we're talking about and how your product might fit. Now here, here again, I'm just taking as, as an example here, I'm taking a clothing industry, say Levi's Dockers, high and low price, classic and fashion, one way or another. And from, from these, I would look at those respective four positions there and kind of say, okay, from there, how would I determine psychographics and lifestyle? Now, on this, I'm just sort of throwing in this company's 10 brands and how they might happen to fit on here. Certainly, if you're doing this and, and figuring out what your market's all about, um, you also want to include the competition. Now, you notice there on that, there, there's nothing in there in that bottom right-hand corner. You notice that? that? That thing's empty down there. So, fashion and low price, well, that's, a, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? You couldn't have anything in fashion, fashion low price. So, there couldn't be anything in there, could there? Mm. Well, let's sort of think about that. You sort of think fashion, low price, oxymoron, nobody could be there, a oh, whole. You should, you should be cued to that by now, because when anyone ever says to you, oh, there's no market for that, it means it's all yours, buddy. So, what about the Target $89 wedding dress? How many wedding dresses you ladies gonna buy in the course of your lifetime? Three, four? Good heavens. Why not get one for um, $89 at Target? It gets you in the door, doesn't it, in that thing? Now, you may not like where you're positioned, so you might try to reposition where you are. Uh, that is, change where you fit in the customer's mind, if you can. If you're going to do that, by the way, it is easier to expand your position than to try to totally change it. Like Frosted Flakes. Frosted Flakes is not just for uh, little kids anymore. Even grown-ups can like Frosted Flakes. Or Baby Shampoo is not just for babies anymore, baby. H&R Block would love to reposition themselves as not just being a tax place that does business two, three months a year, but to get into being someone that is a full-line accounting business. By the way, if I, if I were uh, in H&R Block and working with them, I really think that I would be kind of working on a business model that would get them into being outsourced accounting services for businesses here and there, which would get me working 12 months a year and reposition the company as not just tax service overall. Similar thing, uh, fast food restaurants. I'm back in the old days. I remember when McDonald's and Burger King and these guys would open up at 10.30 in the morning because it's lunch and dinner. Well, holy mackerel, we've got this building just sitting there and no one's in it. We expand the position to include breakfast. So that we're going to have breakfast, we're going to have this building open from 6 o'clock in the morning on. Let's look at similar positions here in the auto industry, for example. Um, We've got here, up in Prestige Conservative Products, I got Cadillac uh, positioning themselves up with Mercedes and Lexus. Now, here's the thing about this for Cadillac, kind of wondering, um, do they want to stay up there? Oh, do, it's trying to be the old man's car? Or would they kind of like to get more over there with BMW and Porsche and be kind of more on the sporty end of this thing? 
on their positioning, uh, this comes down to a very interesting story on, on General Motors on the Oldsmobile division. I remember they were running the commercial. It's not just your grandfather's Oldsmobile. Yes, it was. They never were able to reposition Oldsmobile, and it died. Now, as we've noted, remember we were talking about Buick? The average age of a Buick buyer is 71. What are you going to do to reposition Buick? Gee, I don't know what you're going to do with this. Here's, a, here's another one on positioning. This is a classic case here. What's well, SlimFast? SlimFast. Yeah, it's a, it's a diet drink. And so instead of at lunch, instead of having a burger fries, drink a SlimFast. Sounds good. Then um, what's Insure? In, insure, that's for old people that don't have teeth. So they can't chew a meal or something like that. So they'll drink an Insure to get all their, all their good vitamins and minerals and all their daily supplements and all that stuff. They don't have to chew it. Um, it's the same product, people. <laughs> it is, it, all it is is just different positioning in the minds of the customer. I was saying for years, I was going to come out with a new product. I, I was going to basically, I was going to take this exact same thing, slim, slim, fast, and sure, and I was going to position it to guys who were getting through working out in the gym for the day. I was going to call it beefcake. Hey, guys, you know, after a big hard day at the gym, uh, you don't just want to have a can of pop or something like this. Have yourself a beefcake. They preempted me. They came out with muscle milk. Same thing. Great idea of positioning. Same product. Put a different name on it. Put a different position on it. So hey, that's topic nine. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.